the identity for ourselves. Perhaps because our identity has been taken away from us against our will, or because of an unfortunate event, or it's just time to rediscover our true selves. Have you ever had a time in your life when everything's going really well, then something unexpected happens and messes up your plans? In my case, this has happened twice in my life. My husband and I had been together since I was 19 years old. I was the homemaker, the organizer, the emotional cheerleader, uh, and the breadwinner. I was totally and utterly committed. I loved being married and was looking forward to being a mother. Then one night, my husband, my partner of 14 years, calmly and quietly announced that he didn't love me anymore and he was leaving. I'd been in this pair my entire adult life, and within 12 hours, he was gone, and I was alone in the world. My past was apparently worthless. My future, as I thought I knew it, was gone. What I thought I knew, I didn't. It was brutal. That was the first time my whole identity was challenged, and I had to figure out who I was now that I wasn't a wife. I chose to throw myself into sports. Now, by getting into sport, I mean I really took a deep dive. Uh, I chose to swim, bike, and run some 20 hours a week. I became an Ironman triathlete. My favorite event involved swimming 2.4 miles, biking 112 miles, and running a marathon back to back. A few years ago, I was on a good roll. I was being coached by one of the best triathlon coaches in the world. I had my first race of the season coming up in just a week, and I was chatting every day with my crush who lived in another state. I had a spring in my step, I was fit, and I was strong. On a Friday afternoon, I was doing my last hard bike session before this race, hill reps on a local mountain road, up hard, cruise down, up down, up down. Rolling home on the last down, the last thing I remember was seeing this car turn right in front of me. And I remember thinking, I'm going to hit that car. It was so close, I was powerless. I don't remember the impact of crashing into the side of the car. I don't remember flying over the roof of the car and crashing into the tarmac, for which I'm really grateful to my brain. In the ER, they tended to wounds on my face, my shoulder, my left leg. They did CAT scans and x-rays, and no one would mention my right leg, which hurt like crazy. And I was completely strapped down, so I couldn't see my own body. After about two hours, a surgeon came and broke the bad news that I had broken my right leg and my knee was pretty badly busted open. In a few hours, my world turned upside down. My crush texted though, excited to be on his way to Europe the next day and wanting to chat. I apparently replied, I'm having kind of a bad day here, could we chat later? <laughs> Everyone who's experienced this kind of sudden change had their entire identity um, threatened and survived as most people do, will have done so in their own unique way. I'd like to share with you some things I've learned from these two times where my identity was threatened and how I redesigned my identity, reclaimed my place in the world. So others may see you through their own view of your identity. When I was reinventing myself as an athlete in the aftermath of my broken marriage, many friends and family thought I'd just lost my mind. I joined a local triathlon club and my peers there advised that even if I could build up the physical strength to do a half Ironman, which was my original goal, that that also required so much mental strength that I just wouldn't be fit for it, not, not in my state. Which was understandable given that I often turned up to swim practice in tears and it's really hard to swim when you're sobbing. <laughs> So it was difficult for others to see me, this grieving woman, seemingly weak, as someone fit to tackle grueling endurance races. But they were 
mistaken. My grief fueled me. It enabled me to go deep and find where I could find joy and what I was prepared to suffer for. I find energy to cross some threshold in what I was physically and mentally capable of. And pushing myself in the sport made me feel just totally alive. After the accident, mostly with strangers, I noticed that when you have a visual indicator that you're injured, people see you differently. You look like a victim, an invalid, someone in need of sympathy or judgment. You have to explain your situation to curious strangers. At an airport once, the man who was pushing my wheelchair asked if I had a job before I became disabled. The only ones who continued to treat me as an equal, even though I maybe didn't feel like it, were my fellow athletes. And they shared their joys and pains with training and racing, and we just asked how I was progressing with my rehab. One of my challenges was just climbing the stairs in my apartment, something so seemingly easy, so every day, but it was such a physical challenge that the hospital staff had advised me just to crawl up and down the stairs. Instead, I had a physical therapist friend teach me how to do it standing up on my crutches. And then I started timing myself, of course. <laughs> I remember one friend, Rachel, who's a world-class Ironman triathlete, um, having coffee with her one morning and her telling me about this crazy hard run session they'd done that morning, like ready to pass out, they were running so hard. And I told her about my latest effort on the stairs and laughed at what polar opposites we were. And she said, no, we're not. It's basically the same. Deep down, my fellow athletes seemed to know and just accept that we were both challenging ourselves as best we could. Yes, it, it takes a community. I didn't do sport in my earlier life. I was the kid who had a doctor's note to get out of sport through most of high school. And even when I started training, I didn't set out to become an athlete. I just fell in love with the process. Even once I'd done several full distance Ironman races, I didn't feel like a real athlete. I find reassurance and acceptance of that identity through a sense of community. In particular with friendships with um, professional athletes. And somehow they were the ones that really encouraged me and respected my efforts and, and welcomed me into this new world. I was once introduced to a group of professional triathletes with, he is like a pro, just slower. Uh, one summer, I spent a month training in France with a group of friends who were all professional triathletes. Uh, on this one day, we were all going to do the same long bike ride. I set out a few hours early, I'd be slower. And this ride took me up and over um, mountains in the French Alps, and it was it rained all day. I was cold and miserable. Uh, I had moments thinking I might die of pneumonia or die on these twisty mountain descents and in freezing fog. I just kept turning the pedals. And I got back to the apartment some eight hours later to find my friends sitting around a log fire. And one of them said, oh god, we turned back after an hour. The weather was so bad. I apparently just muttered, Bastards on the background. <laughs> uh, changed into my running shoes and went straight back outside in the rain, did my run, finished the day's training as per the plan. And I heard later that one of the pros said to the rest, We need to keep you the fuck up. <laughs> so it was a huge boost having these people that I looked up to not just accept me into their world, but to hear them say that maybe they could learn something from me. Gaining that sense of belonging, that sharing that common um, identity really helped not just shape, but let me enjoy that new identity as an athlete. But 
But yeah, you don't need to be tough to get through a tough situation. We're not comfortable with other people's discomfort, or even our own. We cross the road from the widow, unsure what to say, in the face of her grief. We don't like difficult experiences, and we don't like pain or suffering. So our tendency is to resist those experiences, to push them away, or pretend they're not happening. After my crash, a lot of people would say to me, oh, it could have been so much worse. And I even find myself consoling others who weren't sure what to say to me with, oh, it's okay, it could have been so much worse. And I, I know it's difficult for those around to handle as well, so I, I try and assure those that I love that I can have positive plans for my recovery, but sometimes I'm just really feeling this struggle right now. Facing injury or pain doesn't require a binary response. You know, I can have room in my head for the, the good and the bad. I'm an independent person, especially so the last few years. After that crash, my injuries meant that I couldn't even safely get in and out of the shower by myself for the first few weeks. And things like standing up to cook a meal were so exhausting that I barely had the energy to eat it. So I simply had to ask for help and be honest with myself and with my friends and what I needed. I find there are three stages to getting better at this. Step one is removing, oh I'm fine from your answers. Step two is answering honestly when people ask, is there anything I can do to help? And step three is just asking for that help unprompted. And even though it's uncomfortable, I find it's really helpful to be able to acknowledge the pain of others, to be able to be vulnerable, and just say, yes, I would love your help. Also, just to respond to yourself with, with curiosity. Like during a marathon, you'd speak to yourself differently at different stages. Maybe at the start, you have a lot of nervous energy and you'd enthusiastically push yourself. You're ready, go get it. To in the middle where you're maybe starting to struggle and you'd speak sternly to yourself to stay on track. Stay strong, don't walk. To the final stretch where you're exhausted and you'd maybe gently coach yourself. You're nearly there, keep going. This is exactly the way I try to respond to myself, just with empathy and curiosity. To respond to yourself with an energy that matches the current state. While I've been in rehab, I've, I've struggled with the difference between what I used to be able to do and what I could do now. When I was given the go-ahead to walk after being on crutches for months, I find that I didn't know how. Um, when when your leg hasn't borne weight for several months, the, the muscles waste away, the, the tendons and the nerve endings in your foot, say, can't, like, haven't had contact with the ground. Your whole leg forgets how to go through the motion of walking. And it sounds ridiculous, but even your arms, having been glued to the handles of crutches, forget that they're meant to take part in this process as well. So, here I am, this badass endurance athlete, having a physical therapist teach me how one goes through the motions of walking. I had to learn to try and respond to myself with compassion and curiosity. And my reminder to do that has been to just say to myself, huh, that's interesting. So, my leg doesn't remember how to walk. Huh, that's interesting. And I asked myself, like, how can I respond to this? What is life expecting of me now in this moment? I've learned that it's useful to be a little pessimistic. I've read some professional athletes write about injury as a mental challenge, a temporary setback. But what if it's not? What do you do if the setback is permanent? I have permanent scars on my face and body, which is annoying, but tolerable. But what if I'm never pain free? What if I can never run again? What if 
I can be an athlete. Early on, I closed my mind to these thoughts. When I was first told I had a broken leg in the shock, I didn't really grasp the severity of the situation. Um, I thought I'd maybe just have to be patient for this 12-week number that I we were talking about, and then I could hop back to it. I was looking at braces some 14 weeks out. So some nine months after the initial crash, when I was um, still in pain, still definitely unable to run, I learned that I needed surgery on my knee again, that they actually had to break my leg again to offer the best chance of a fix. So facing a freshly broken leg and a fresh 12 weeks on crutches, I knew something of the difficulty I had. I knew the recovery doesn't follow a linear progression, and that it could be demoralizing, and that it would be slow. So I started confronting those worst case scenarios that I would just simply never run again. I find that facing the worst case scenarios saps it of, of much of its power. It's like an antidote to the anxiety. It's also likely that when things do go wrong, which they will, they'll go less wrong than those worst case fears that you did face. I've moved between trying to push through, maybe slightly deluded about how temporary the setback is, to pondering the worst case scenario that the setback is permanent. I think the only sensible balance is to embrace the insecurity of just not knowing. But there are definitely frequent challenges to embracing that insecurity. How much should I push? How much is too much? How much should I be confident? And how much should I doubt? So the component parts of that identity, I've thought a lot about what the identity of an athlete means to me. If I break it up into component parts, racing is definitely a component. And as I can't run, I can't race, but I can look at all the component parts and ask myself, can I do enough of these parts to still feel like an athlete? Can I give myself permission that being good enough is enough for now? At its core, I think being an athlete is about commitment to pursuing what your body and mind is capable of. So I tell myself then that I'm, I'm still doing that. If I can still um, seek ways to pursue those core goals, then I can maintain the identity of an athlete and that sense of self. And I can build on that. I am an endurance athlete after all. I know professional athletes when they're retiring from racing are often advised to reinvent themselves to move away from thinking of themselves as an athlete to something else, a businesswoman, a student, a parent. I have a friend going through that situation just now and her having seen my experience has helped her realize that actually she doesn't need to take that advice. And yes, she has to adjust to new limits and is um, reinventing herself, but she doesn't have to discard that identity as an athlete. It's part of who she is. There is, however, a danger in over-identifying with one identity or identity label. In the tech world, we have an unhealthy trend to associate our identity with our workplace, like this old post, Kiwi is a GitHubber. I love my work, but I don't want to be defined by where I work. When I started out as a programmer, I was completely uncomfortable with the label programmer because I trained as a fine artist, so clearly I wasn't a real programmer. For about 10 years, I avoided identifying myself as a programmer, um, even though I wrote code for a living. And I had just got comfortable with that label when a friend advised me, you should call yourself an engineer. Engineers get paid more than programmers, and pretty much from that moment I've been okay calling myself an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Making software is part of what I do with my life, but who 
who I work for is not who I am. If we identify too closely with our job, what happens to that identity if the job changes? What would happen if you lost your job? Who are you then? So a moral of the story, perhaps it's healthier to have an elastic identity, to be aware of all of the labels that make up this entity known as you, and what they mean to you right now. You should be prepared for the times where you might have to struggle to keep that identity, or the times you'll have to adapt it, or evolve it, or even let it go. I've learned that I'm not going to be the same athlete as I once was. I, I just don't know yet how that will be true. But I am committed to the process of finding out and trying to influence that, that outcome and as best I can. The French have a wonderful phrase. They shout, bon courage to cyclists climbing up mountains. The root of the word courage is core, the Latin for heart. And technically, we translate this phrase to mean good luck. But it means so much more than that. There, there's an empathy to it. We all suffer. Keep going, put your heart into it. You can't finish an Ironman without putting your heart, body, and soul into it. And the same applies to anything difficult that we try to tackle in life. Sometimes putting your heart into it means to hang in there to fight. Maybe sometimes it means to just curl up and have a good cry. I think it means being true and compassionate to whatever you need in that moment. You wouldn't identify with being an athlete or a wife or a mother if you felt half-hearted about it. Whatever identity is important to you, throw your wholehearted intention into that. Know what it means to you to be an athlete, a wife, a husband, a mother, a father, a friend, a manager, a designer, or an engineer. Know too that you are simply human and when something happens out of your control, which it will, that the one thing you can control is how you respond. Bon courage. Thank you.